welcome you, God. Fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe. Give us a great glimpse of a never changing God. So all we want. So all we want and all we need is found in you, is found in you, Jesus, every victory is found in you, is found in you. Open wide, our hearts bow to you. Welcome, guys. You guys can go ahead and have a uh, quick seat here. Well, welcome to Oak Point. Uh, my name is Mike. Um, we're all about knowing Jesus and making him known. Um, so we're excited about service today. Uh, we have a guest speaker uh, who's going to be leading us through the rest of Ephesians 2, uh, but a little bit more on that shortly. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that uh, came up, we will have to reschedule our kids' opening and so we're going to have to do that next weekend uh, as there are protocol exposures that have happened uh, or potential exposures among our staff volunteer team. Uh, we are simply following our protocol and feel that this is the safest move for our families. We will be back next weekend with protocols in place. Please pre-register on the Church Center app or at oakpoint.org slash canton slash events. If nothing else, this also serves as a great reminder for why our protocols are so important. So please let us know when you are coming to service through our Save a Seat program and wear your masks in the building and maintain a safe distance from other households. Thanks so much for your help with all of that. So uh, before we dive into some more worship, we're going to read uh, the passage of scripture that we are going to be going through today. 
So I invite you guys to read with me on the screens. Ephesians 2, verse 11 starts, Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without hope in God. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting, setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we, have, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I invite you guys to stand with us as we continue in worship. storm surrounding me, let it break at your name still, call the sea to still, the rage of me to still. Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, oh Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Call these bones to live, call these lungs to see. Silence for you, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence for
we can look to you today, Jesus. That you are our heart's treasure, God. That you are what fills us, God. Nothing here that's temporary can do that, God. So we look to you today, Jesus. And you are our vision, God. You are our light to our path, God. And you are our peace. So we just focus on you today, God. And we just put everything else aside and trust you today, Lord. Pray a blessing over the message today from Adam, God, and a blessing over everyone here. Thank you. You can be seated. Well, as I said earlier, we are going to have a guest speaker speaking today, and that man is Adam Mashney. He is our high school pastor over at Oak Point Novi. So I'm super excited to introduce him, and um, I'm excited for him to deliver today's message. So I hope you guys enjoy. Well, good morning. How y'all doing? Like, uh, like Mike just said, I'm Adam Mashney. I'm the high school pastor at our Novi campus, and I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thanks for joining us here uh, in the theater. Thanks for joining us online. We're incredibly, incredibly grateful that you are here. Um, really, there's one big difference between Mark and myself. Really, one. We look the same. Everything else is the same. One big difference between Mark and myself is I root for the, el- the other college football team. Um, and I can't even say the better because in many instances we aren't the better football team, but it's the other team. Go blue. Anyone with me? Anyone with me? Online you can like, I don't know, give a thumbs up or something. Uh, but I was born and raised in Michigan. I root for Michigan. It's it's the, it's the better there. I'll, I'll just say it. It's the better, it's the better team. Um, I'm married, been married for about six and a half years. We have a wonderful son. His name is Caleb. There's a family picture for you. Megan and Caleb are um, the better parts of me. Um, and Megan's pregnant. We're expecting a baby girl June, er, um, early June. So we're excited about that. Um, and like I said, I work as a high school pastor. I've been in youth ministry for about 18 years, ever since I was Um, out of high school. I started volunteering and being interning, worked with junior hires and high schoolers, and it has been quite the journey, let me tell you. But uh, before we dive into today's topic, I'm curious if anyone has ever seen one of those uh, HGTV, like before, after shows, like Fixer Upper. Anyone? Show of hands. If you're at home, you can still raise your hand. All right, cool. So you've seen those. Uh, One of the most popular, as you know, is Chip and Joanna Gaines, like the Fixer Upper show. They've exploded. There's so many things, like their styles and Target and every, all that stuff. It's incredible how, how much this show and other shows like it have caught on. And it's this whole idea of before, after. There's some pictures probably being shown of like they take one space and they totally revamp it to create a brand new space, whether it's a room or a house. Uh, they, you know, Chip and Joanna, they go in, they meet with their client, and they say, okay, what do you want it to look like? You know, do we have to go down to the studs? What do we got to break down? Chip loves to, like, break walls down, which is super fun to watch. I'm not, you know, Chip, I, I, get, I, I don't have an ounce of Chip gains in my body. But during quarantine, like, we moved to Brighton, like January of 2020, and uh, right before the pandemic hit, and all of a sudden we had this stay-at-home order. We're like, well, okay, I'm working from home. Uh, what, what, what house projects do we want to do? And spring was coming, so we decided we wanted to create a fire pit. So we have a little bit of woods in our backyard. So the first picture we'll show you is just like what we started with. And we're like, okay, what, how do we do this? The second picture is kind of like the work in progress. And this last picture is what we ended up with. And we're super super thrilled with our fire pit, and it's this whole idea of before and after. And now the reason we're talking about before and after is today's section of Ephesians is a classic before and after. And in fact, Mark mentioned last week that Paul really writes five instances where he says, formally now. You remember that? Mark said, really, there's five of them. Formally you were this, now you are this. And today we're looking at the second of those five. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, 
Yeah, whether you're here or at home, go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians 2. That's where we'll be. Ephesians 2, we're going to start with verse 11. And now what I want to do is I want to read through the passage very slowly and it, uh, give commentary where we need it. And then by the end of the passage, what I'd love to do is give us three keys that will unlock this truth in our life. So if you want to, you can picture a door that is currently blocking this truth from getting into many lives, even ourselves. And so by the end of this, I hope to give us some keys to unlock that door so we can continue walking with Jesus, continue walking in our faith, and continue walking in what Paul thinks to say in unity. And so let's dive into Ephesians 2, verse 11. The first word we'll see is, therefore. Everyone say, therefore. Even at home, say, therefore, no matter where you're at. Maybe you're at a coffee shop. Maybe just whisper, therefore. Therefore, pause, time out. I heard once that whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you should ask yourself, what is it there for? You get it to play on words. What is it there for? Now, I'm not going to pause after every word, I promise you that, but I will make a lot of pauses. And so what is this section there for? Paul says, therefore. Well, as you learned last week, the first, formerly, and now. This is a continuation of Paul's thought. This is a continuation uh, where Mark talked about formerly, you were dead in your sins. Mark painted this, this vivid picture of, of you were dead. And Paul paints this vivid picture of without Jesus, you're a goner. Like there's no hope. Uh, and so formerly you were that, but God, remember last week, but God made you alive in Christ. And so this is a continuation of that thought. Paul is saying here, because of that truth, because you are alive in Christ, you're no longer dead in your sin, let's talk about one implication of that. Let's talk about what that means in everyday life. And so Paul is moving now to some application pieces because of this amazing truth that we are alive in Christ. So, therefore, therefore, remember that formerly, there's the word, formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called, quote, uncircumcised by those who call themselves, quote, the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God. Now, pause. Let's first address this circumcision, uncircumcised language. There, there was, seemed to be this like uh, labels being thrown around. See, Gentiles were non-Jews by birth, and because of that, they did not have, nor did they live by the covenants, covenant of Abraham, which was set up in, with the Israelites, which required circumcision. They didn't have that. So Paul's pointing out that the Jews probably had a label for the Gentiles, even in the church, where Jews and Gentiles were a part of this church in Ephesus, there seemed to be some sort of label. Imagine that as a label. Today we have labels like tall, skinny, short, fat. You know, like imagine being in a part of a conversation and someone says, oh yeah, him? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uncircumcised. Yeah, super weird, super strange, and yet this idea is seemingly a part of the church in Ephesus. There it was. There seemed to be a label of like, hey, we're the circumcised. They're the uncircumcised. Now, Paul does add this little caveat, which I love in parentheses. He says, which is done in the body by human hands. So he's kind of like, he's, he's talking about Gentiles here in this passage, but he, he makes it known that, yeah, any Jew who who boast themselves in the circumcision part, yeah, it's, it's really just done by human hands. The spiritual implications is over because of Jesus on the cross. It doesn't have any spiritual implication. It is merely a physical thing. But back to the Gentiles before we move on to the Jews as well. So Paul here is addressing the formally, the, the Gentiles, and he's imploring them to remember what it was like not to be included not to be part of God's family. One commentary I read stated that Paul listed five areas that the Gentiles were missing out on. Here are the five. You can read them right in Ephesians 2. Separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God. 
And so these five key areas, they're huge. Like this is a bleak future for the Gentiles. The Jews, they had in themselves a future to look forward to. They had the covenants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David even. They had these covenants that God had promised them. They had these promises to hold on to. The Gentiles had none of that. Now, they, they actually did because the whole point of the Abrahamic covenant was to be a blessing to the rest of the nation. The Gentiles didn't know that, though. The Gentiles were unaware. So literally, they were sitting there with a future that had nothing in it. And Paul is saying, hey, remember that. Take a, take a pause and remember that you were once excluded. Like Mark said last week, you were dead in your sins. Not like half dead. You were dead dead. Like dead. And here, Paul is painting a picture of exclusion. Like you weren't even family friends of the Israelites. You were enemies. Like he is painting this vivid picture. I think of like a campsite and being excommunicated from the campsite. It's, it's an enemy of the people of God. So let's keep reading. Paul implores them to remember. Let's keep reading. But now, there's the whole formerly now. This is his second. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's the contrast. Paul loves these. The, the, the before and after picture of a house. Like the before is bleak and the after picture is stunning. And it's amazing. And the room is transformed. It's incredible. This is Paul's before after. Now, you who were once far away have been brought near. That, that picture I had in my mind of the campsite and people being excommunicated for it. Just, just imagine them going and ushering that person who was excommunicated back into the center of the camp and reinstating them as a part of the family. It's this vivid picture of being brought near. Um, in the Jewish culture, there was, this, there was this dynamic that if you became Jewish, if you were brought into the Jewish uh, religion, you were, quote, brought near into the family of God. This is the picture, what Paul is trying to say. Let's read on. For he himself, meaning Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. Now here, we see Paul not just to address the Gentiles, and now he's bringing up the Jews, all of Israel. He said two groups, meaning the Jews and the Gentiles. He's saying that through Jesus... Our peace, the Gentiles and the Jews, are now one, one new people group, the church. Now, this was a letter to the Ephesians. Remember, Paul had planted this church, and so he knew these people. He had spent, I think it was up to three years with these people in Ephesus. So Paul, Paul likely had taught this to them. Paul likely had uh, reminded them time and time again, but this was not just a letter to Ephesus. As you know, this was more one of the general epistles, and so this was to be circulated through all the churches. And so Paul here is making a point that we are one in Christ, no matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. He mentioned this in Galatians. He says, hey, you're, you're no longer male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. We are one in Christ. Paul does mention here this dividing wall of hostility and a barrier. You read that in Ephesians 2 in the section that we're looking at. Some scholars think he's referring to the actual temple wall that separated Gentiles from the Jews. If you study the temple court, there's the inner, the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, and that's where the high priest once a year could go in, offer sacrifices. And then you have... The next, kind of the outer circle of that, which really the Levites could um, do their priestly duties. And then uh, Jewish men could go to the next layer. Jewish women had their own court. And then on the outer court was the court of the Gentiles. And it was very clear. There's a big wall separating from where the Gentiles could go in to where the Jews were. And, I mean, they took this very seriously. Uh, there's an inscription. There was actual an inscription found when they were digging things up. I want to read it to you because I think it's um, indicative of how Jews thought of Gentiles and how Gentiles were excluded. 
So check out this inscription. It was on the wall uh, leading into where the Jews were, but the Gentiles could read it. It says this, No foreigner may enter within the barrier and enclosure around the temple. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. So you literally could not walk three feet past where that wall was or you'd be killed. This hostility between the Jews and Gentiles was huge. It was actually a law that a Jew could not help a Gentile woman during childbirth. She, like, they couldn't offer help uh, because it was said to believe that, that well, that's you helping another Gentile enter the world. It was hostile. It was very, very uh, enemy territory kind of language, this dividing wall of hostility, this barrier that Paul mentions. If you read Acts 21, you'll actually see Paul getting in trouble. He was arrested because he was falsely accused of bringing an Ephesian Gentile into the inner courts. Past that inscription, he was thrown in prison, and I think it was in that prison time where he wrote some of the letters. He was falsely accused for, do, for bringing in an in, in Ephesian Gentile. They, they took this so seriously. And here we have Paul saying, Jesus has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. The barrier that was set up, he has destroyed. Now, physically, that wall still stood probably eight years after Paul wrote this letter. The AD 70 is when the temple was destroyed. And he wrote this around 60 to 62. And so you know that it's metaphorical at this point, but the wall eventually was destroyed. We have physical walls today, don't we? And metaphorical walls, don't get me wrong. But there are walls in our world. Um, I, I saw one such wall when I uh, took a trip to Israel. Uh, it was a, a learning trip that I had the opportunity to go to with some incredible people um, back in 2016, I think. And uh, part of the trip was going down to the Gaza Strip. And the wall that divided Israel and Gaza was real. It was huge. But there was a group of people there that were sick of the fighting, there's a group of people there that wanted peace. And so they literally turned this wall into a peace project, a path to peace. They decorated this wall. It was a physical rep representation of hostility. It was a physical representation of, hey, Jews and Palestinians just don't get along. And for me, being Palestinian, it was emotional being there saying, like, hey, I, I now have a new family. I'm, I'm a part of the kingdom of God, and yet I love to see two groups of people throw away the wall of hostility and say, we are one in Christ. So we have physical walls. We have metaphorical walls, too. We have many walls. And so Paul is talking about how Jesus has literally and metaphorically broken down the walls. So let's continue in Ephesians with um, the next verse. Why did Jesus do this? His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near." Now, he is talking about the reconciliation that happens between Jews and Gentiles together, but it starts with reconciliation that happens with God. So, so Jesus literally reconciles Gentiles to God and Jews to God. It's not like, it's not like one had it right. So the Jews, they missed it. They, they, missed their, like they missed the whole deal. They were stuck in the law of Moses, following all the regulations and commands, Gentiles missed it too. Gentiles were stuck in their own ignorance and, and their own ways. And, and so Jesus literally reconciled both people groups to God. And by doing that, reconciled both of them to each other. Now, he uses the word new. One new humanity. And it's a beautiful picture because the, there's two Greek words for the word new. One is called neos. Uh, and that has the meaning of um, kind of a, new, a newness as it relates to time. So like a car getting off the assembly line uh, it is new. It's the newest. It, you know, there's a million others like it, but it's the newest. It's the most recent. That's neos. Uh, then the other Greek word for new is kainos. And that word indicates a newness of quality. Like there is something new 
and there's nothing like it ever before. And Paul, guess which word he uses? Kainos. He uses the word that indicates Jesus didn't just, just make something that's like been there before. Jesus created something entirely new, something that has never existed. And so Jews and Gentiles, they needed this reconciliation to God. They needed to be saved. And isn't that sometimes how it works with us? Sometimes we, we create these dividing walls. Sometimes we try to reconcile with people before reconciling with God. And Paul is saying here, no, it's out of order. Salvation through Jesus paves the way for peace with others. Let's continue reading. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. That word access, I loved studying this because the word access has this picture of this, well, in, in ancient days, there was this role in kingdoms where this, this person's only role was to meet people at the door and decide whether or not they could gain access to, to the king. That, like, that was their only role. And, and this word has the connotation that when you come to the door, the person says, yeah, come on in. He opens the door and gives you access to the king. This is so rich. For through him, Jesus, we both have access to the Father. We both have access. Jews, Gentiles, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, because of all this, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, in Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So Paul is closing this section by bringing the fact that they are no longer enemies. He's, he's re reiterating that they are no longer excluded. They are family members, parts of the household. He shifts his language, talking about a body, which he does elsewhere. If you read 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about the, body, the, the church as a body and how it's supposed to function. He shifts that, and he's now talking about a building, a household. And it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but it has Jesus as the cornerstone. And if you study this at all, you know that cornerstone, that piece was huge. In ancient days, it was literally the one thing that everything was measured upon and everything was placed upon. And so this cornerstone meant everything. Paul's point was clear. Jesus means everything to the kingdom. Jesus means everything to the church. Without him, it all falls apart. Without him as the cornerstone, there's nothing left. And so Paul masterfully paints this whole picture. Starts with, hey, remember who you were. And then he talks about, hey, you, you are one new humanity. You two groups of people, Jesus has tore down the dividing wall of hostility. The barrier that once tore you apart is broken. And so you now can become one new humanity. And then he closes it out by saying, hey, for, you know, the body is great. You are now a house being built. Jew and Gentile together, you're a part of the house. If, you ever, if you've ever constructed something, you know that pieces have to work together. They, they have to go together. They have to work together in unity or your structure is going to fall apart. And this is the whole point of this passage. Unity in the church is what matters. Paul is saying unity is important. And so three keys to unlock unity. Because I really, really think that if we don't intentionally take steps, we will naturally fall to what our own desires tell us to do. And so the first key, if you're taking notes, whether here or at home, the first key is we have to remember what pre-Jesus life looks like. In our own minds, we have to bring us to a place where we recognize and remember that this is, you know, Jesus has changed a lot. This is what Paul was saying in the beginning of chapter 2. We once were dead in our sins. 
And Paul is reiterating to the Gentiles, by the way, this is all of us, he's reiterating that you once were excluded. In this specific context, Paul is imploring them to remember what it was like to be not included, to to not be aware of the promises of God. But what would it look like for us to make a saved from list? I talk to many students, junior high, high school alike, and they tell me that uh, when they think about their testimony, their story of how they met Jesus and what Jesus has done in their life, they tell me that oftentimes they, they think it's just boring. They think that because they don't have the saved from drugs and alcohol and sex and a life of sin, they, they, they think it's not a robust story that Jesus didn't really save them from a lot. And so we sit down with them and we tell them, no, no, if we read Scripture correctly, it doesn't matter if you were steeped in you know, addiction and sin. It doesn't matter if you were living the church-going life as a kid. We were all in the same boat. Every one of us was dead. Remember, not half dead, dead dead. Like, we were all in that boat. And because of Jesus' work on the cross, we are now alive. And so, yes, no testimony, no story of meeting Jesus is boring. And so what if you just took some time and you remembered the pre-Jesus life. And you just spent some time saying, okay, yeah, Jesus has saved me from so many things. And maybe I wasn't experiencing all the addictions, but that's because Jesus has saved me from those. And without Jesus, who knows what my life would have been like? Who knows? Jesus has saved us from those things. If it wasn't for Jesus, I'd be down a road, and it wouldn't be good. And so that's the first key. Paul, Paul tells the Gentiles to do this, and I think he could tell us to do this. Remember what it was like. Remember. Because once we remember what it was like, we'll be extra grateful for the life we have in Jesus. Remembering leads to gratitude. Number two, recognize where peace comes from. We need to recognize that he himself is our peace. We need to know that in our minds and in our hearts that it's Christ and nothing else. Now get this, peace is not found in stripping away everything that makes you and I unique. It's not in making Jews more like Gentiles or Gentiles more like Jews. Jesus didn't do that. He made one new group where Jews and Gentiles could still be themselves, but they are a part of something bigger. It's peace is found by being aware of our differences, but choosing to have the common ground of Jesus, what unites us, and that's the Jesus Christ. He is our peace. See, Jews and Gentiles had different cultural norms. They were very different. They put their, Jews put their trust in religion. Gentiles put their trust in power, achievement, knowledge. They came from different families. They had different lenses in how they viewed the world. Um, Like I said, there was a literal and metaphorical wall, yet they were united. And Paul makes this point very clear. They were united because Jesus himself was the peace. The gospel was for both Jews and Gentiles. They both needed to be brought near. And the Holy Spirit helps us look beyond the barriers that used to divide us. The Holy Spirit inside of us helps us. See, we're not united today by agreeing on political party or what car we drive or what neighborhood we live in or uh, where our kids go to school or how much money we have. Those things don't unite us. In fact, we've seen this past year they have the power to cause more division than we ever could imagine. What unites us is the same thing that united the church in Ephesus that was consisted of many different people groups, and it's Jesus. And it's the cross. He is our peace. Jesus reconciles us first to him and then to each other in that order. And it's all because of Jesus. Number three, because of this, we need to intentionally choose oneness. Intentionally choose oneness. This is where the rubber hits the road. We can remember what our pre-Jesus life is like. We can recognize where peace comes from, but we need to actually intentionally choose oneness because here's the deal. You will inevitably meet people who are different than you, who think different than you, who look different than you, and they have different lens of the world. They have different everything, and you'll have a choice in that moment. 
you can choose to keep the wall of hostility up, or you can choose oneness. You can choose this new humanity that Jesus chose to bring. The new, not new off an assembly line like there's a lot of others like it. No, no, no. New as in nothing else in the world is like it. This new people group. We are one in Jesus. It's not easy to do. The things that could separate us often do, but we need to intentionally to choose oneness. And so here's the bottom line. And I think Paul would would say this to a group of Jews and Gentiles together. Here's the bottom line. When presented with differences, default to oneness. When presented with differences, default to oneness. There will be plenty of opportunities to bring up walls, build fences. Jesus would have us tear down walls, tear down the fences, and choose oneness in him. He's the one that brought the church together. He's the one that unified two very different people groups. And it wasn't just Jews and Gentiles. Greeks had their own version of a dividing wall. In that time, if you weren't a Greek, if you didn't speak Greek, you were, you were thought as a barbarian. And so it wasn't just Jews, Gentiles. It, it, it's everywhere. And, and we know this, right? We know that it's everywhere. And yet Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, allows us and empowers us to tear down those walls tear down the fences, and when presented with differences, we default to oneness. So may we be a people. When you leave this building, when you leave home, and you run errands, and you go about your life, may we be a people that when differences arise, may we just be curious, may we be aware of ourselves, and may we default to one in Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it is alive and active. We thank you for, for Paul and Ephesians. Jesus, may you give us the courage and the strength to live this out. God, we're so encouraged that we're not the only ones to have to do, deal with this problem of, of differentness and walls of hostility and barriers. May we Lean on your power, Jesus, to help break down these walls. And I pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite you guys to stand with us as we close with a song of worship that the Lord is our living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Savior, I'm yours.
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Yes, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are our living hope, that you are the one that reminds us what unity looks like. Lord, we thank you and we praise you that we are able to go forward with you or that you are the one that guides us. Lord, we thank you and praise you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.